GeoGwitch and welcome back to GeoGwitch Ministries or welcome to GeoGwitch Ministries if it is your first time. I hope you find today's sermon enjoyable but more so I hope you find it edifying and even convicting. If you are a non-believer I hope you stick around and I hope that God uses this sermon in your life to bring you to the faith. God bless and enjoy. So we are back again in Luke. It's been a while but I'm glad to be back obviously between the ending of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3 a lot of time has elapsed both in you know for me and also in the book those are different degrees for me obviously i've covered jude and hosea in the intermittent period and for the book a fair bit of time has passed we ended off in luke chapter 2 verse 80 and jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with god and man and that was the account of him being a boy in the temple when he was 12. Sorry, not chapter 2, verse 80, chapter 2, verse 52. Uh, I'm thinking of chapter 1, verse 80, which says, And the child, talking about John the Baptist, grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance. So chapter 1 focuses a lot more on John, and it ends up by saying, And he grew into a man... And you know became very spiritual and so on and then chapter two does the same with jesus saying and then he grew and so on and so forth and now we come to chapter three and we are back with john we are with john the baptist and today we're doing verses one two and three so we're here now with john the baptist at the beginning of his ministry so let's get into it in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Itria and Traconius and the Licinia tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Ananias and Cathias, the word of God came to John the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So we'll start with verse 1, of course. We see this is uh, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, um, Herod, Philip, uh, Lysanias. I, don't, I can't say these names. You know, we get a lot of names. Abeline, however you say these names. We're getting a lot of different names, again, hammering home that point that this is a historical context. This doesn't start with at some stage, at some point, some things happen. It's OK, I can give you names and from those names we can get dates. And we're introduced to a very interesting character, Pontius Pilate. Uh, we're not going to find out much about him today. We're not going to find out much about him for a while, in fact. Um, of course, that's something you can go and research yourself. We all know Pontius Pilate, we all know the um, the significance he will come to play later on in the story. But for now, we're here. Um, so, you know, just, if you don't know him, keep that name in mind, Pontius Pilate, as we continue. But as I say, Luke starts off with names. And he's done this a bit so far. He started off chapter 1, the first four verses. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having followed... Sorry, I'm reading the complete wrong section. <laughs> we're sorry, it's verse 5, not starting verse 4, not starting at verse 1. Verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And then the beginning of chapter 2. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was governor of Syria, and so on. So we do get names, we get real names, we get names of people, of places, and from that we can get times, we can work out when from all the different names i'm not going to go into it but we can work out from all the different names when in these people's reigns we are when what year it is we're pretty confident of the year i've seen some people possibly even pretty confident of the month but i wouldn't be too sure about that uh, but you know people are able to get a lot from this 
he doesn't tell us, Luke doesn't tell us a lot. He tells us a little from which we can get a lot. He doesn't tell us, you know, the reign of Tiberius at six o'clock on the 3rd of May, year seven or whatever. He just says, Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Herod, and so on. And from these different names, we can get so much. And obviously from the historical records from the time, we can get so much, but it really does help enforce this fact that this is fact. This isn't something the author has just made up. Now we're going on to verse two. During the high priesthood of, Anna, of Annas and Cephas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Now we start off hearing something quite strange. During the high priesthood of Annas and Cephas, this is strange. There's only meant to be one priest, one high priest, excuse me. So if there's only one high priest, this is a historical inaccuracy because we know there never was any two high priests. There never was, it wasn't allowed, there could only be one. So how can it be that there are two here? It must be a historical inaccuracy, right? Well, no. John Calvin, I'm going to read, it's a fairly lengthy quote. John Calvin says, Annas and Caphias being the high priest, it is certain that there never were two priests who held the office of high priests at the same time. Josephus states that Valerius Gratus made Caphias high priest a short time before he left the government. During the time that Pilate was governor of Judah, Josephus does not speak of him as giving of having uh, made any change in this respect, but on the contrary states that when Pilate had been recalled from the government and sent to plead the cause of Rome, Vitalus, who was at the time governor of Syria, reduced Caphias to a private rank and transferred the high priesthood to Jonathan, the son of Ananus. When Luke says that there were two high priests, we must not understand him to mean that both held the same title, but that the honour of priesthood was partly shared with him by Annas, his father-in-law. Luke's narrative indicates such a state of trouble and confusion that though there was not more than one person who was actually high priest, the sacred office was torn in pieces by ambition and tyranny. And I think that really goes to show the state of things like i said before we're just finished our study through hosea and a lot of the themes of the book of hosea have to do with the failures of the leaders hosea spends a lot of time giving out to the leaders rightly so um if we go to chapter four of hosea i'll just read um, from verse 1 to verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing and committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns and all who dwell in it languish and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Yet let no one contend and let no one accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. So it's clear throughout a lot of God's word that priesthood is something that's taken seriously. Being a leader, especially a religious leader, is something that's taken seriously. When we look at all the qualifications the Bible gives us, I won't read them out now, we look at all the qualifications it gives us, and the Bible also tells us that the religious leaders will be judged more harshly than anyone else. We see how important this role is. And here in verse 2 of chapter 3 of the book of Luke, we see that it has been torn asunder. It has been torn in half. And it is being shared by two people when it belongs only to one. And this shows the spiritual state of decline of the land. Because of course, if the people are going into spiritual decline, it's up to the leaders to rein them in, keep them in check, keep them with the Lord and so on. 
But if the leaders, the ones who are in charge, the ones who are meant to make sure the flock stays in the right pasture, if those leaders are themselves wandering off or doing horrible things that they were in Hosea, idolatry and all of that, or here are simply just mismanaging the role, mismanaging the office, they're not managing to do their job properly, well, that will always have disastrous consequences. There's a reason the Bible is so harsh about false teachers because false teachers cause so much damage there's a reason that the book of jude is entirely dedicated to the topic of false preachers there's a reason the book of hosea dedicates a long time to false preachers there's a reason jesus spoke about false teachers there's a reason that so many people paul for example, spoke about false teachers. There's a reason that Paul, when you read Paul's letters, a lot of it is saying, you've messed up. Now, there are some good things. Obviously, we read Paul, some of the times he's saying, oh, well done, you're doing this well. But most of his letters have an awful lot of, you've messed up, pal. Now, to different degrees, obviously. Um, there are some things like... For example, in some le in one letter he says, I, I'm, I'm astonished that you've managed to go away from the faith so quickly. So, you know, there's, di there's different degrees of the times he's not as harsh and so on, um, depending on the level of the false teaching. But, he, he, you know, he, we don't have any letters from Paul saying, hey, I just want to say, you're, you're doing great. Well done. There's nothing like that. There's always some level of, even if he, he even if he's praising them, saying, well done, there's always something like, well done, but you could do this better. Well done, but you're doing this wrong. Because decent but flawed isn't really good enough when it comes to doctrine. You cannot have, you know, three types of doctrine. There's biblical doctrine, there's false doctrine, and then there's, eh, you know, it's all right. You can't have that. Unfortunately, that's the position we find ourselves in today. Uh, it's a rather, it's a horrible, horrible position when you think about it. It is, it, it is a comforting and a lovely thing to see people who have theological disagreements coming together despite their disagreements and still recognizing that they are brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ or whatever. That is a wonderful thing. What's not a wonderful thing is that they have to do that. What's not a wonderful thing is that they have the disagreements. Paul, in his letters, never said, I disagree with you, but that's okay. Of course, he didn't use writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, there are some things where we don't have to do that. We should still talk them out and so on, but that it's better to do that than go labeling people heretics. For example, if someone had had a false view of baptism, Paul would have wrote straight to them and say, no, you're wrong about this. Change this now. But we can't really have that same attitude anymore. If it's the credo versus pagan baptist debate, we have to say, I believe you're wrong. I'm going to give my scriptures. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And we're going to try together to come towards, you know, the truth of God, towards God's truth, towards what he has to say. And ultimately doing it to honor him and to give glory to him and do what he wants. But if we don't come to the same conclusion, we recognize we're still brothers and it's not a primary issue. And false teaching has gotten so prevalent that we, we've had to come up with tears we have to come up with it because if you're wrong on a secondary issue you're still wrong on the doctrine of the bible you're still believing something that's false still believing in a false teaching now you're not believing in a false teaching that's downable you're not believing in a false teaching that means you are outside the christian faith there's a great deal of difference between your view on baptism and your view on the trinity for example, there's a great deal of difference between your view of Calvinism versus Arminianism than there is between your view of Christianity versus Islam. But that doesn't mean, of course, that we should just ignore the differences and stride to forget them. No, we should always be working with our brothers and sisters who disagree with us to come to the conclusion of the Bible and remember that the Bible and not ourselves is the most important thing. That God's truth and not our opinion is most important. 
I think every debate or every conversation about doctrine must have that the heart of it. This is not one fella trying to convince another fella that he's right. This is two people going to the Bible and working towards God, tr God's truth. And if the one fella happens to be proven right, then, you know, great. And if not, then he needs to be able to take that and move towards God's truth. Because arrogance in this situation is horrible. Arrogance in most situations is horrible. Arrogance with God's truth. Um, ar arrogance any truth is horrible. If you're having a conversation with someone and it's a mild disagreement and you will die on the hill even though you might possibly be wrong uh, and you're just arrogant towards them, of course, it's such a horrible thing anyway. There's never a situation, I believe, where that sort of a thing is called for. Now, ar arrogance and assurance in your own argument are not the same thing. If you, if you have good evidence for what you believe and you're sure of it, if you have good reasons and arguments and so on, that's different than arrogance, but you get what I mean. But when we come to God's word with arrogance, we come to God's word with pride, we're going to go to the verse and put stuff into it rather than coming and taking stuff out. These sorts of people go to the Bible and when they're done with it, it's two ton heavier for all the stuff they've added. And that's not what we should be doing. But the reason that we have to have these discussions, that we have to have these debates and sometimes arguments even, is because of false teaching. We have to remember, whatever side, I'm just going to assume I'm right, just for the sake of argument, when it comes to the baptism thing, right? I'm a, I'm a credo-baptist, right? So let's assume that credo-baptism definitely is, is true. That means that when paedo-baptism started, it was a false doctrine. It was a false doctrine. Um, we didn't have any qualifications. There was no, no, it's all right. It was a false doctrine. If you believed it, you had to change your mind. But eventually other things started coming in. And I say eventually, it was quite quickly. Like, for example, the idea that Christ wasn't Lord. Christ wasn't God. Unitarianism and, and so on. And so eventually what happened was people had to say, look, we'll disagree on this. We're still brothers and sisters, that sort of a thing. But, yeah. And like I say, to have disagreement with a brother and sis or sister and still recognize them as that brother and sister, as your brother and sister in Christ, is still a wonderful thing. But the thing behind it, the reason for you having to do that is false doctrine, and that's not a wonderful thing at all. And it's no wonder that we have such an abundance of false doctrine today, because we have an abundance of false teachers today. We have so many false teachers today. But it's not a new phenomenon. As we see here, there were people at the time, like Annas and Gappius, who didn't treat the role they had been given properly. They didn't respect it properly. And so they tore it apart. And such is the importance of a leader who understands the Bible, not someone who's coming and trying to lift up the audience, not someone who's coming and trying to make everybody happy, not someone who's coming in to try and make everyone feel good, someone who knows the Bible and is willing to say what it says. Otherwise, they'll lead nations astray. We also see in this verse, the word of God came to John, that's John the Baptist, John the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And of course, John the Baptist, better translated as John the Baptizer, um, when it's translated, I think Baptist used to just mean what bat a baptizer means now. Um, obviously not John the Baptist, as in John from the SBC. You know, but I think he's still translated mostly as John the Baptist just for tradition and because the word can still be used like that. But I just thought I'd throw that in there. So John here is being called by God to leave the wilderness and go out and preach and now John wasn't living a, his, his best life he was living on the ground eating whatever he thought wouldn't kill him whenever he was hungry drinking whatever he thought wouldn't kill him whenever he was thirsty and so on he wasn't living the high life that many people are throwing around today that's promoted so much today he wasn't living that life at all he was living on the bare essentials food water God. And those three things are all you need to survive. 
We're going on to verse 3. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What does this mean? Well, that word baptism or baptismal uh, means to dip in liquid. Obviously, it carries the connotation of cleansing. And in fact, likely does come from Old Testament purification rites. It's probably symbolic, or the symbolism of it comes from Old Testament, um, Old Testament purification rituals. But there's, but there's an interesting thing now. This is the first thing we hear so far about baptism. Well, baptism used to be practiced on Gentiles. When they wanted to enter the Jewish faith, it was quite a, a straight process. And it still is now. I had a friend who wanted to become a Jew and, and, and legitimately wanted to become a Jew. They wanted to convert and... They were telling me about the process. Thankfully, they've since then they've come to to know Christ as their Lord. Uh, but they, you know, they wanted to be a Jew, and they were telling me about all these steps you have to go through, like the four steps or something. That I can't remember exactly. It's a while ago now, but it's a, it's a process they take seriously. You just you don't just get to say, "Hey, I'm a Jew." I mean, you probably could. I can't imagine you'd be kicked out of a synagogue if anyone found out that you hadn't gone through all the steps. But to be officially a Jew, I guess, or something, officially registered or something like that by somebody, you have to go through a lot of steps. It, it's, it, it is a process that the officials or, or some higher up somewhere take quite seriously um, to this day. And they took it seriously back then. Back then, if you were a Gentile and you wanted to convert to Judaism, you would have to get circumcised still. Um... But you would also have to be baptized. So Gentiles would be baptized and then they would become Jewish. They become they go from the people of the world to the people of God. And so what John is doing here, when he tells Jews to be baptized, he's telling them, you're Gentiles, essentially, you're people of the world. Come and be baptized and be people of God. And so now we're starting to get introduced to this idea. Now we're leaving the Old Testament coming into New Testament times. We're starting to get introduced to this idea. You're not saved because of where you're born. You're saved because God calls you. And now people from anywhere can be saved. The Jew, the Gentile, anyone from anywhere can be saved by God. It's not specifically just for the Jews anymore. But that idea is really more so hinted at in this verse than it is actually in it. What this verse is more so about is saying the Jews of the time were not God's people. They were not acting as God's people. Or at least those who were willingly baptised, willingly accepted that they had not been God's people and that they had been acting like the world and now they wanted to repent and be forgiven and of course repentance is such an important thing and the bible tells us a lot to repent the bible tells us all over the place to repent if we go to second chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then i will hear from heaven and i will forgive their sin and will heal their land the word repent is not used there but the idea is the same we want to see a usage of the word repent we go to acts 319 repent then and turn to god so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repentance is something we are told to do a lot. Of course, repentance has always been recognised as a wonderful thing. Thomas Carlyle says, of all acts of man, repentance is the most divine. The greatness, uh, the greatest of all faults, is to be conscious of none. Repentance is such an important part of the Christian life, and I believe of life in general and so john was calling people to be baptized baptized baptism obviously being the outward expression of an inward faith i believe the expression is he was calling them to be baptized and to repent he wasn't just calling them to be baptized he wasn't just saying you're acting like the gentiles come here i'll dip you in the water and off you go no he was saying repent 
And what does that word repent mean? Well, repent famously now comes from metanoia, from the Greek word metanoia. I say famously because that's the word you hear prosperity preachers. Yes, I'm talking about them again. Prosperity preachers throwing around all the time. Metanoia. Metanoia means turn from your thoughts of pro uh, poverty and towards the blessing of God. No, it doesn't. Metanoia means change your mind. Simple as that. Metanoia means, in the, in the context of repentance, in the context of the Christian faith, metanoia means you turn from your sinful ways towards God. You turn away from your past towards God. You don't turn from poverty towards wealth. Because if you don't have God, it doesn't matter where you're going, you're going to hell. It doesn't matter where you look, you're going to hell. And he, God speaks a lot against materialism, so I, I think, you know, turn from the old ways towards ways that's going to make God more angry. That's not good advice for if you want to, you want to join the Christian faith. But John says, repent for the forgiveness of sins. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And that's what repentance leads to, the forgiveness of sins. Not the, some blessing. I mean, rep the, repent the forgiveness of sins is a great blessing. It's a wonderful blessing. And it's good enough. And it's more than good enough. And it's shameful that some so-called Christian preachers can't even accept it. And, and they want so much more. But repentance of the forgiveness of sins, uh, or, sorry, the forgiveness of sins is the blessing, is, is a great blessing. And repentance is how we can... Get that, and of course, true repentance is granted by God. Um, he gives He gives the gift of repentance to His faithful, to His people, to His elect, to His saints, and so on. But to repent means to change your mind from the old ways towards the new. And as well as that, what that means is that the Christian, the saved Christian, does not repent of their sins. Because to repent of your sins means you're looking one way, you're changing completely and going the other way. If you're looking at God and you repent, you metanoia, that means you're going from looking at God to changing away. The Christian can be looking at God and still stumble, still sin. In fact, we do. That doesn't mean we take our focus entirely away from God. So you really only repent once. Now, you're penitent, you're repentant, you're sorry. More than that, every time you sin, every time you fall, you feel that sorrow for your sins. But you don't actually repent. You don't change your mind. You don't metanoia. You don't completely change everything because that change has already happened it wasn't insignificant it wasn't insufficient the first time you're still not perfect but you are changed now so you don't go about doing it again you don't repeat the process again it was good enough the first time though you're not good enough the repentance was good enough and so I must ask, if you are listening to this, you have not repented of your sins, you do not believe in the gospel, I ask you to do it. Now people are like, oh, what, why? Why? I'm, I'm, I'm happy as I am. I'm happy as I am. And, and I think preachers, they, 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 miss, they miss the mark on this. They say, oh, you're not truly happy. Some people are truly happy. I, believe, I genuinely believe some people are truly happy without God. I genuinely believe that. But that happiness won't last. You'll die and go to hell and you won't be happy then. Because that's where you stand to gain from turning away from God. Turn away from God, you might be happy for a while, won't last long. And a, a lifetime of earthly happiness will not be in any way equal a fraction of a second of the wrath of God bearing down upon you in hell. Oh, but I'm a decent person, you say. I'm, I'm, I've never killed anyone, never cheated on anyone. I'm sure, you know, I drink, I swear, I, you know, I, I do all these things and I'm, I'm, you know, whatever. But if I'm not that bad, oh, yeah, you are. 
You've broken one law, you've broken them all. It's a serious thing to break any of them. Well, I've never broken any of the laws, God. Yes, you have. The Bible says everyone is a sinner. No exceptions, not me, not you, not anyone. You're a sinner. You're headed for hell. You're headed to where you deserve to go, where we all deserve to go. So my plea with you is repent of your sins. Turn away. Turn away. You won't be perfect afterwards, but you're still going to try. You turn away and you look towards God. And you believe in the power of Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. Because he is our only hope. I hope you enjoyed today's sermon. If you would like some other ways of consuming G Witch Ministries, then go to the links in my About section on my YouTube channel, and you will find my website, my TikTok, my Instagram, and my Spotify, where you can find either snippets of these sermons or the full sermons. If you would like to finance these sermons or help me monetarily, then you can also find my Patreon. You don't have to do this, but it would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for watching. God bless. And son, I'll just